Hello and welcome to Dragon Bites, the paediatric podcast aimed at paediatric trainees or anyone interested in child health. I'm Asim, one of the paediatric trainees in Wales and one of the presenters for Dragon Bites. This week we're going to continue our series of cardiology lectures about left to right shunts. Professor Orhan Uzun is going to tell us all about ventricular septal defect in the first of two episodes on this topic. Anyway, let's get started. Awesome. <laughs> Hello again, Professor Uzun. Hello. How nice to meet again. <laughs> yeah. I'm very excited. Me too. Um, yeah. We had some excellent teaching from you last week. It was brilliant. So we covered um, we covered vein of Galen malformation and then we covered ASDs. Um, and you've been kind enough to invite me back to speak to me some more, which I, I, I'm so grateful for. Today, I was hoping to entertain, <laughs> also uh, educate. Fantastic. Um, our listeners on uh, VSD, mm -hmm. it stands for ventricular septal defect. Mm -hmm. It's not a company name or anything like that. <laughs> so we'll stick to our ideas. And second one will be patent ductus arteriosus, mm -hmm. an AP window. That's right. And anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. But today I'm going to concentrate on VSD. Sure. Now we are in the ventricular chamber. Mm -hmm. We talked about the shunts above the atrium, mm -hmm. peripheral arteriovenous malformations, just a recap. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked about the intracardiac but intraatrial shunts, ASD. Now we're going to move to ventricular component below the tricuspid and mitral valve. Mm -hmm. This is not an artificial separation. Mm -hmm. Is there such need to say if the shunt is above the inlet valves versus below the inlet valves? One may present earlier, say in infancy, mm -hmm. and the other one may present later on in teenage years and adult years. Yeah, so that would be, so it would be the ASD, wouldn't it, that we established last week would present later on. Um, but, or, and, and I know by default we can figure out that that means in infancy must be when VSDs present. Correct. But I also remember this from, from things you said to me previously about how um, other heart lesions can present. And from what I recall, it's somehow, and you can correct me as we, we go through this, it's somehow related to how um, pulmonary vascular resistance drops with Spot time. On. Spot on. PVR. Hmm. PVR and also the other factor for these shunts to cause any um, effect or hemodynamic problem relating to transit time of the shunt goes through the defect. Mm -hmm. If the transit time is long, it leads to dilatation of that chamber mm -hmm. and more functional problems. Right. If the transit time is short, then the chamber receiving blood will not have enough time to dilate because the extra volume will not stay in that chamber to give wall stress mm -hmm. and stretch the chamber and walls. Mm -hmm. And hence, the amount of blood going into the right side will be going to the lungs faster, resulting in reverse increase in flow, reverse increase in chamber size. Hence, although the shunt is left to right, the left side would get larger. Right. Is it okay? Yeah. But the, uh, the shunts above the inlet valves, uh, flow is slow, stays in the atrium, mm. goes through a tricuspid valve, um, remains in the ventricle for a little bit before it's, it gets ejected into the uh, pulmonary arteries. Hence, there is enough time for that volume to exert its influence on the wall of the right ventricle and right atrium. I see. And it dilates the atrium of the right and ventricle of the right again. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the left chambers don't get dilated. I see. Because... When it returns to that atrium, the shunt again stays in the left atrium but goes straight down to the right atrium without waiting much um, longer than a few seconds in the left atrium. It's not enough for the left atrium to get dilated. Right. So this is the recap about the previous podcast yeah. and our learning message. So VSD is the most common left to right shunt at ventricular level 
It is also most common congenital heart disease that we encounter in population. Mm. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. It's amongst the cyanotic and non-cyanotic overall congenital heart disease. The reason for that, ventricular septum, if you think about it, it develops gradually up to eight weeks of gestation. Mm -hmm. Because prior to that, we have common ventricle and there is no ventricular septum. Mm. During that process, the ventricular septum develops from endocardial cushion mm -hmm. at the base, where the mitral and tricuspid valves also develop from the same structure, and also from the bottom at the apex. Those two ends grow, mm -hmm. and eventually they merge, fuse, um, anteriorly, posteriorly, as well as superiorly and inferiorly. Mm -hmm. And during that fusion, if any gap is left, then the ventricular septal defect would ensue. Right. So hence, ventricular septal defect is a developmental abnormality in the sense that the fusion did not happen and the ventricular septum did not form and left some gaps between upper and lower portions at any level. Mm -hmm. um, when a child is still in uh, mother's uterus, VSTs might present themselves in different way than when the child is born. Uh, VSTs antenatally, depending on the size, would not lead to any change in the way the heart works and the pumps blood and the pressures are equal in fetal life anyway. Yeah. And there are also shunts, multiple shunts in fetal life, namely foramen ovale and patent ductus arteriosus mm -hmm. and also ductus venosus. They all provide shunting. Mm -hmm. And the saturation in umbilical artery is maximum 85%. Um, percent. Mm -hmm. And by the time it, it gets propelled into the aorta, um, oxygen-rich blood, its oxygen saturation drops to 65%. Mm -hmm. So from 8 to 5, by the time it reaches the left ventricle, saturation drops to 65. So um, maximum 70, no more than that. Brain receives majority of it. Mm. And hence, VSTs don't cause much problem. Mm. Problem starts when the pressure difference becomes obvious. Mm. And that's relating to drop in PVR, normal normalization of pulmonary artery pressure. It may happen within days, it may happen, it may um, take longer than a few days, a week, sometime longer, two weeks, sometime a month, mm -hmm. and sometime very rarely never. And the pulmonary hypertension um, causes further problems, not just the VSD related, but also pulmonary vascular resistance related problems. Mm -hmm. So VSD alone can also lead to such delay in PVR normalizing. Mm -hmm. We need to remember. So you can question why some babies are presenting early, some later. Yeah. So individual differences. Right. Also, whether VSD is a sole lesion and presents on its own, whether it is associated with other pathologies. Mm -hmm. Then you may have sometimes not VSD-related symptoms, but cyanosis mm -hmm. as the dominating lesion, like the transposition of the great arteries, tetralogy of follow and VSD, mm -hmm. and you would have more cyanosis. Yeah. If the VSD is big in transposition, it would cause blueness as well as breathlessness. Mm -hmm. But in tetralogy of fallow, doesn't matter how big it is, because pulmonary stenosis would have protected the baby. Mm -hmm. So there wouldn't be any cardiac failure signs, but rather cyanosis. Mm -hmm. So therefore, and depending on the amount of blood goes to the lungs, so we call it restricted flow to the lungs or non-restricted flow. If the amount of flow goes to the lungs non-restricted, there is no pulmonary stenosis, those babies would become breathless. Hmm. They would develop congestive heart failure. Whatever the scenario is, transposition, maybe pink follow, maybe double outlet. But if there is pulmonary stenosis, it protects them. Hmm. Did you know that? No, it didn't. And it's odd to think of pulmonary stenosis as a protective factor. That's correct. Mm. Um, and also, remember, 
if there is no pulmonary stenosis, we imitate pulmonary stenosis surgically. Hmm. Can you remember any surgical intervention? Banding? Absolutely, spot hmm. on. So pulmonary artery banding is utilized in cases where there is no limitation of blood flow to the lungs. Hmm. If, if there is no pulmonary stenosis, then you have to create one. And then take time by time for the baby to grow, to come to an appropriate age and size mm. for us to repair the VSD or whatever the lesions are. Mm. Because in small babies, we do not tend to go in and repair VSDs unless baby reaches certain kilogram and certain height. We will talk about it in the treatment section. Sure. So let's not give it away straight <laughs> yeah. now and leave it to the end of our discussion. Otherwise, sure. they won't listen to us. No, exactly. They'll give up. <laughs> so um, next um, after this introduction, perhaps we can talk about a type of VSDs. Mm. If you think about the septum, septum at its base, underneath the mitral and tricuspid valve, is very thin, mm. and that's called membranous septum. So when we call, so what we're referring to as the base of the septum is actually it's it the aspect that's closest to the tricuspid valve. That's correct. That, that so mid portion of the heart. Mm. So the junction between atrium and ventricle mm. is called membranous septum. Mm -hmm. So septum is very thin and um, very um, mobile sometimes, but most of the time septum uh, is robust, however thinner than the rest of the myocardium. Mm. But it has very little myocardial elements in it. Mm. What is also important in the membranous septum, you have stepwise hinge point or attachment of the mitral and tricuspid valve. Mm. So mitral valve attaches onto the membranous septum higher up, closer to the atrium, mm. and tricuspid valve attaches lower down. Mm. Think of a step. Right. So right step lower, there is a membranous septum, and a centimeter above, mitral valve attaches to the membranous septum. Mm -hmm. There is also membranous septum below the tricuspid valve. Right. So a membranous septum is divided into two components, supra tricuspid, mm -hmm. infra tricuspid. Okay. Supra tricuspid element, the section between tricuspid and mitral valve insertion, is called atrioventricular membranous septum. Okay. Atrioventricular. Why? If there is a VSD in that section, shunt goes from left ventricle into the right atrium. It's called Gebode defect. Gebode. G-E-R-B-O-D-E. -E. Okay. Gebode. I've never heard of this defect before. Here you go. That's another <laughs> special feature of these podcasts. We will wow. tell you a lot of unknown stuff. <laughs> Fab. Okay, so let's see if I picture this correctly because I think our listeners need to get a sort of image around this anatomy. So we've got at the, at the junction of the atria and the ventricles, that segment of the ventricular septum is membranous. However, it's split into, or you can almost envision it as two halves because the tricuspid segment attaches further down this membranous segment than the mitral part. So, so it's just separated into two issues, two areas. So, if there's a defect, but in the upper portion of this membrane segment, it would fall between where the tricuspid valve is and where the mitral valve is. Hence, why this Gaboda defect leads from the left ventricle into the right atrium rather than the right ventricle. Perfect, mm -hmm. because of the amount of pressure the left ventricle can generate mm -hmm. would be huge. And the amount of blood going through that membrane septum into the right atrium, which is a low pressure chamber, would be massive. Mm. And hence these babies would become more breathless, more symptomatic. Mm. And what happens if there is a defect in that section? Very interestingly, the mitral valve drops down and becomes at the same level as the tricuspid valve. Mm. When it happens, then a different type of VSD emerge. Mm. We call that inlet VSD. Mm. Inlet VSD. It is quite common in trisomies. Trisomy 13, 18, and particularly trisomy 21, Down syndrome babies. Mm. If the 
inlet valves, tricuspid and mitral valve, are attached in stepwise fashion. We call that AV valve offsetting. Mm -hmm. AV valve offsetting. If that offsetting is lost, they become at the same level with linear attachment, not stepwise attachment. This is a hallmark of AV septal defect and Down syndrome in 50% of the cases. Wow. So that's the another section. So what we learned now, perimembranous VSD or membranous VSD. There isn't a pure membranous VSD. Okay. Most of the time, a little bit muscular component also involved. Mm. Hence the term perimembranous comes to. Mm. So very rarely, of course, you can have isolated membranous VSD, mm. like in inlet VSDs. Inlet VSDs are membranous. Mm. So inlet VSDs are the hole below the mitral and tricuspid valve and the mitral and tricuspid valves are at the same level. Right. That is the membranous VSD, and we call it inlet VSD. Mm -hmm. So inlet VSD can be muscular inlet, membranous inlet, but majority of the time they are membranous. Mm -hmm. And the membranous, when you see a membranous VSD, um, almost 99% of the time, it will be an inlet VSD, and 50% of the time, those babies will have Down syndrome mm. or trisomies. Wow. So that's why it is important. If it is perimembranous VSD, a little bit muscular component is also involved, but the offsetting of AV valves are retained. Mm. So mitral and tricuspid valves are stepwise yeah. attached to the septum, but there is a VSD underneath the tricuspid and mitral valves or tricuspid valve. We call it perimembranous VSD. Mm -hmm. And in terms of genetic association, these are more common in patients with 22K11 deletion. Okay. DeGeorge syndrome. That's also different than the inlet VSD. So this separation of VSD location is not an artificial one. And treatment is also different and symptoms are different. Hmm. Which one is most common? Perimembranous one. Okay. Perimembranous VSDs are more common postnatally. Mm -hmm. Antenatally, we also see muscular VSDs uh, almost equal to perimembranous VSD. Mm. But because muscular VSDs close quickly, we do tend to see muscular VSD less often than the perimembranous. Right. But the muscular VSDs are second more common. Mm. But the membranous ones, third common VSDs. Okay. The perimembranous VSD can happen underneath the valves or below the aortic valve. Most of the time, 90% of the time, over 90%, underneath the aortic valve. Mm -hmm. What is the significance of it? Threefold. One, genetic association. Two, symptoms, early symptoms. Three, leading to other problems such as aortic regurgitation or being associated with other problems like mitral stenosis, coarctation, so on. Mm -hmm. So perimembranous VSD most commonly seen VSD in other congenital heart disease right? compared to inlet or compared to muscular VSD. And they present very early. Perimembranous VSDs compared to other type of VSDs. Mm -hmm. Third type is muscular VSD. Muscular VSD occurs below the membranous portion of the ventricular septum. Mm. Some people call it, call it trabecular VSDs, trabecular. And muscular VSDs, hardly associated with genetic abnormalities. If they are small, they are usually isolated and they close by themselves. Mm. They do not require treatment if they are small or moderate size. Mm -hmm. If they are moderately large or large, they do require some time treatment, either with intervention, device closure, or surgery. Mm -hmm. Again, we'll talk about those later on. Yeah. And a presentation of these muscular VSDs also um, is later on, usually incidental. Someone hears a murmur, and a loud murmur, mm. in fact, is frightening, isn't it? Yeah. Loud murmur. In fact, loud murmur, as we said before, for muscular VSD, it indicates the hole is small, hmm. so you don't need to worry about it. Yeah. In fact, if patient has a VSD and murmur is not loud, you should think, hmm, 
a problem is going to happen here. I've got to keep an eye on this baby. Mm. Fourth type is the less often seen VSD type, and it happens below the pulmonary valve. Mm. And the tissue between the pulmonary and aortic valve becomes so deficient and pulmonary and aortic valve become at the same level. Mm. In normal babies, pulmonary valve is higher than the aorta. Mm -hmm. If there is a outlet VSD, we call that doubly committed VSD, doubly committed. That's mm. the fourth type. It brings the pulmonary valve down and make them at the same level. Mm. And that's how we define it. So doubly committed VSD. Those babies also tend to have symptoms earlier on mm. compared to muscular VSD. Right. So did we understand the classification? Yeah. Now let's talk about clinical manifestations. What do you think? So we defined it, yeah. what it is. We defined the classification. We defined the frequency. We also mentioned about the presentation. But now we can elaborate on presentation mm. much better. So when you take a history in a child, um, it depends on the age, mm. the presentation will vary. Let's start with infancy mm. and neonatal period. What would be the expected presentation of a child due to left to right shunt at ventricular level? Um, so it would be... No pulmonary stenosis, so no restricted pulmonary flow. Yeah. Large VSD, small VSD, moderate VSD, what sort of... So, finding um, you would expect or symptoms would you expect a breathless baby with perhaps failure to thrive failure to thrive isn't it breathless breathlessness is very difficult to define in uh, in your neonate sure. and and um, infant mm. the first thing would be this baby is not feeding mm. this baby is not growing faltering growth mm. feeding is very important for us mm. growth is very important for us if baby beyond two weeks has not gained any weight by th the third week and you have to look into left to right shunt mm. this is absolutely crucial mm. one of the most common reason so first sign and second sign is breathlessness mm. so tell me what sort of signs would you in me and in you i would tell i can't breathe mm. I'm, I'm just out of breath yeah how would a baby um exert those signs to you so i suppose that you'd be looking for... start from top to bottom Oh, oh Start from the face. Um, so nasal flaring. Excellent. Grunting. Before grunting, head. Head bobbing. Excellent. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, then grunting. Good. Some tracheal tug. Good. Um, intercostal and subcostal recessions. Brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely wonderful. So th those are the signs. What about mum's observation? What sort of observational finding mum would tell you in terms of combined feeding and breathlessness together. And so mums would probably point out that it's during feeding that their breath, the baby becomes even more breathless. But how would mum, mum wouldn't say breathless? What maybe, would she say? Maybe would keep, uh, says that she keeps stopping feeding. Exactly, wonderful, keep stopping. Mm. And what would mum say in terms of finishing the bottle or finishing one breast? Yeah, never, never manages to finish a bottle, never completes a feed, gets too tired, falls asleep. Excellent. Falls asleep. Mm. Brilliant. The other one stops very frequently. Mm. He sucks, he suckles twice, three times, four times, no more than perhaps a minute, stops. Mm. What else would you expect mom to say? Sweating? Yeah, sweating. Yeah. Sweats a lot. Uh, he becomes um, out of breath, but he sweats a lot when he's suck suckling. Mm. Excellent. So mom said all these things. Then what, what else um, you can ask the baby? Um, any other additional finding you want? Does it look dusky? Yeah. Would we'll you ask that, wouldn't you? Does, does, does his colour change? Mm. If baby looks pale, then mm. it means that baby is um, it's retrieving blood from peripheral circulation mm. to utilise it um, for supporting cardiac circulation. Yeah. Uh, if baby becomes blue and, and dusky, then it would point you towards inlet VSD. Okay. It would point you towards large VSDs with right to left shunt, additional pulmonary stenosis. Mm. It would point you towards transposition, double outlet to tell of fallow, mm. or um, TAPVD with obstruction. Mm. So 
you got to ask those color changes. How does the baby look? Does it look dusky and blue? So we finish all that history taking. Now it will come to physical examination. So start with small VST, infants, small VST, and then we'll go to larger individuals, mm. you know, bigger individuals. So beyond infancy, VSTs present themselves differently. Mm. Mostly mama, mm. mostly mama. And by that time, we would have detected it. Mm. Or if it is relating to pulmonary stenosis, maybe a little bit cyanosis too, mm. majority of them. Um, breathlessness exceedingly rare in this day and age because it means that things got worse yeah. and the baby might have developed already some pulmonary hypertension or other problems. Mm -hmm. But in infancy and uh, neonates, small VSDs would be well developed and acyanotic. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And um, so if there is a poor weight gain um, and baby has a little bit cyanosis or clubbing, then you would be alarmed. Yeah. So you look for clubbing, you look for um, cyanosis in baby's lips mm -hmm. and also eyelids. Mm -hmm. So you need to look at those those parts. Then um, it may suggest either additional pathology like tetralogy or transposition or maybe early onset Eisenmenger syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. So Eisenmenger syndrome is not good news. It's not good news. So if um, this child has small um, VSD, then auscultation would reveal what? A loud, a loud murmur. Excellent. So yeah. loud intensity, harsh murmur, mm. typical of VSD murmur mm. due to high vibrations, high resistance across the VSD. Yeah. Because during systole, you hear the murmur. Mm. During systole, two edges of the, the VSD hole get closer. As it gets closer, it squeezes it. Mm. Sometimes it squeezes so much, you get a squeaky yeah. uh, murmur, very small uh, muscular VST, like mm. So this kind of high pitch murmur is heard in very, very small VSTs mm. because it almost collapses and closes yeah. at end systole. So loud, harsh murmur, it, it should reassure you. Yeah. So if the VST is bigger, murmurs could be still louder mm -hmm. Um, and loud, but not the loudest. And if it is moderate size or large VSD, then um, you may have other findings on auscultation or palpation. Mm. With palpation, we've forgotten actually, we just reversed the order. Mm. So after examining the child, you would put your hand on the chest, wouldn't you? Mm. So say, small VSD, hemodynamically insignificant, asymptomatic child. Mm. Would the left ventricular impulse prominent? No, I don't think so. How about large VHT leading to volume loading of LV? Yeah, then you'd expect a, an impulse there. Exactly. Would just the left ventricle become prominent or would you have hyperdynamic precordium involving entire precordium? Yeah, I suspect the whole precordium would Absolutely. be involved. So the difference between isolated LVH mm. and volume loading LV mm or isolated right ventricular dilatation or right ventricular pressure loading, this is typical scenario of left to right shunts mm. where precordium would be dynamic, mm. dynamic precordium. When you put your hand, it would lift your entire palm. Mm. So when you put on the apex, the apical impulse would be prominent. When you go to the right side, it would be also quite active. Yeah. yeah. And how about when you put your palm would you feel any thrill? Yes. Yes. So higher the murmur, smaller the VST. VST yeah. Okay. But if the VST is in the perimeter septum and the, there is thrill, when there wasn't any thrill, it indicates that VST getting smaller. Mm. So that's a good sign. Okay. Yeah. That is definitely a good sign. So thrill indicates that the VST is getting um, smaller. How about in muscular VSDs? If there is a large VSD mm. and the pressures are equal in both chambers, you wouldn't mm. feel any thrill. Mm. If the VSD is moderate size, yes. If the VSD is small size, yes. Mm. Um, so moderate and small size VSDs would give you thrill, yeah. but the large ones wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So that's what the benefit of 
I'm looking for a thrill. Yeah. Um, would you palpate also patients' peripheral pulses? Well, yeah, I mean, as part of a cardiovascular examination Absolutely. in general. Yeah. What would be a um, reason for increased bounding pulses, we call it, bounding pulses? Mm. Full volume peripheral pulses. Yeah. That's what you would... That's what we expect. We would, we would expect in mm. VSD cases. Mm. So full volume bounding pulses and the active precordium thrill. But thrill can also be felt if there is pulmonary stenosis. Thrill might be felt if there is aortic stenosis. Mm. But if you feel thrill in the mid precordium, mm. mid septal area, mid sternal area, 99% of the time that'll be due to VSD. VSD. So right. that'll help you mm -hmm. in the differential diagnosis. So then the next is what we like, listening to the heart. Mm -hmm. That's what we do, don't we? Without doing all these things in a sequence. Yeah. Um, let's start with the um, non-complicated, mm -hmm. VSD, uncomplicated, and there is no Eisenmenger, there is no pulmonary hypertension, just the VSD. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you would hear just the VSD murmur. Mm -hmm. If the volume is significant, moderate or large, mm. then the amount of shunt comes from the lungs would be huge, mm. and the amount of blood going through the mitral valve would be huge, but the mitral valve size is the same, mm. and it would lead to diastolic rumble, mm. in addition to systolic murmur. Yeah. And the systolic murmur is typically due to shunt across the VSD throughout the systole. Mm. So what we call such murmurs, starting with the first heart sound with no gap, between mm. the first heart sound and the start of murmur, pan systolic, pan -systolic yeah. or holosystolic. Mm. Yeah? So a pan systolic murmur, it doesn't leave any gap between the first heart sound and the start of the murmur. Intensity stays the same. Mm. So that's typical for VSD and it is heard in the third and fourth intercostal space. Mm. Typical. Mm -hmm. And in these babies, sometimes you may hear additional heart sounds like loud second heart sound. If you hear loud second heart sound, pan-systolic murmur, but it's not very loud, mm. what would you think of? What's the cause of second heart sound being loud? On the mitral valve, sorry, uh, on the left side, systemic hypertension. On the right side, pulmonary hypertension. Mm. So if pulmonary hypertension developed in these patients, it's, it's, it's bad news. Mm. So loud second heart sound we should, you should look for. Is the second heart sound is loud or not? Tick, 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 tick. These are the tick boxes. Mm -hmm. Pansystolic murmur, but second heart sound is not intensified. Mm -hmm. You're happy, mm -hmm. right? If it is loud, in addition to that, you should be worried. Right. Okay. And um, what else do you expect? We, we said about mitral regurgitation murmur. So you may hear a pansystolic murmur mm -hmm. in the apex. You might hear a diastolic murmur due to increased flow through the mitral valve, so it's called diastolic rumble. Mm. So in apex, you can have systolic as well as diastolic, yeah. but you should be able to separate it from VST murmur. Mm -hmm. So one is near the sternum, the other one is in the apex, radiating to axilla. Mm -hmm. okay. How about um, tricuspid valve? Would you hear pansystolic murmur in the tricuspid area? Would it be the ones who have the inlet valve? One, the inlet, inlet valve, the, yeah. and there is some pathology in the tricuspid valve. Mm. And second, also this patient has loud second heart sound. Hi pulmonary hypertension. Yes, yeah. if there is pulmonary hypertension, you might also hear tricuspid regurgitation. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you might hear a, a, an additional murmur. So you can have VST murmur, mm. tricuspid regurgitation murmur, mitral regurgitation murmur, and diastolic rumble. Yeah. So four different types of murmurs you need to differentiate. Right. <laughs> Then you're always almost uh, you made a diagnosis. Yeah. So now academic, perhaps curiosity, you will do ECG, mm. chest X-ray, and echocardiogram. Mm -hmm. So ECG shows you what small VST ECG is normal, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. If it is not associated with any other pathology. And that was the first of the two-part series on ventricular septal defects. Join us again next week where we'll be discussing the different investigation findings for ventricular septal defects and the way we manage them. Thank you to Professor Orhan Uzun for recording with us so far. Join us again next week for the rest of this episode. Thank you for listening to Dragon Bites.